So, after philosophy of mind has been shaken by Descartes' skepticism and rationalism, his introduction of the cogito as a problem, really, and the contributions of the empiricists, and the attempt by Immanuel Kant to delimit the scope of reason and to provide uh, some kind of framework, metaphysical framework within which we can think of subjects knowing worlds. The space of possible approaches to describing human experience, human behavior, human being in the world gets much larger, much more organized in some respects. We noted the contrast between representational and non-representational approaches, both of which appear as valid continuations of uh, the questions raised by Kant. Um, I'm just looking forward to the present situation. Here are just some of the many, many positions in contemporary cognitive science that are available. At the top left, we've got substance dualism. The red circle there makes a is supposed to stand for the, the, the mind, the cogito, which is separate from the person. We'll meet the early behavioral psychology, which get, tries to get rid of questions of mind altogether, not successfully. We'll meet various theories about the relationship of brains and bodies to minds. We'll meet identity theory, in which mind is considered to be the same thing as the activity of a brain. We'll meet functionalism, in which the relationship between what we observe and brains is more complex, but nevertheless, the brain is the central organ. We'll meet eliminativism, which seeks to do, again, to do away with psychological talk, mental talk, um, in favor of neuroscientific explanation, um, a form of disenchantment. That's a rather extreme position. We'll meet the intentional stance introduced by Dan Dennett, which is a rhetorical stance by which we approach and understand others as if they have minds without necessarily insisting that those minds are the kind of objects we can study. We'll brush against theories of extended mind in which the vocabulary in which all these problems have arisen might be improved if we recognize that the world is part of our cognition. Um, the central role played in our lives by smartphones and technologies of all sorts might lend some credence to this. Um, and we'll meet a variety of uh, forms of embodied cognition, which seek in some respect to stop attributing mystical properties to the brain. But we haven't got there yet, thanks to Jasper von den Heerik for this wonderful slide. Um, we're still at the early days, and we have not yet met the science of psychology. Now, there is no science of psychology before the middle of the 19th century. It's about 1850 or so. And it's very important to understand why. We noted that when we encountered Descartes, we had to worry about the theologians and religious authorities, institutional religion, was um, still under coming to terms with its relationship to the natural sciences. Until the middle of the 19th century, it was not safe to put forward a scientific theory of the soul. Um, Charles Darwin is the, probably the biggest influence here. The biggest change came about when Darwin's theory of evolution made it clear that we are animals. We belong in the natural order. We are not demigods. We're familiar with that insight now, but it's it's a very, very big change to see us in that way. Charles Darwin's grandfather um, had had theories in this area that he couldn't publish because of the theological context. And really, indeed, at the beginning of the 19th century, the novel Frankenstein, which explores the idea that one might fabricate life or that life might be understood as a physical chemical process. That was such a dangerous novel that had to be written in exile. It was written in Switzerland, of course, by Mary Shelley. But with the revolution of Darwin and with the constant progress in the physical and chemical sciences and the fact that they had started to really, really 
influence and change people's lives, there was now an opening here. Um, it was no longer necessary to doff one's hat to the bishop. And so scientists of all stripes started to wonder, well, our science has been so useful in the material world and the processes of production, development of technologies. Why not apply it to the study of the human condition? So, again, let's, let's, let's make ourselves aware of the history of this. So we've got Descartes, Newton, Kant. We've, we've seen them and several others there. Um, the science of psychology will come later, but before then we've got people like Kelvin, Darwin, Maxwell, Mendeleev, Boltzmann, Planck, who are um, innovators in physics, in chemistry, in study of natural processes of all kinds. Uh, new theories are giving rise to um, new practices of work. The whole fundamental nature of society is being reorganized through the Industrial Revolution. Um, and so science is paying off, if you like, in spades. And so only after all that is it possible to begin to develop a science of psychology. So the names uh, William James, Wundt, Fechner, Dewey, these are the first psychologists, if you like, and they come in the latter half of the 19th century. There's a little overview, if you like, and I've stretched it all the way back to Martin Luther and all somewhat <laughs> vainly all the way up to myself, just to show you that human lives are actually quite long and the history of science is actually quite short. There is very little distance between us and the Protestant Reformation. And all these changes that we've mentioned have happened in a very short period of time. So one might ask, what does this nascent science of psychology aspire to being a science of? I've waved my hands and used words like the human condition and living in the world. Well, there are two terms that are key here, which the emerging sciences of psychology set their sights on. And those are experience and behavior. They're both very difficult words to discuss. Experience seems straightforward. And we don't mean the things that happen to you. We mean their happening to you, in which you, you when we speak of first-person experience, that which you experience, the, if you like, the, all the questions of what it is to be conscious arise here. But there's a separate track, which is trying to understand why people do what they do. Um, what is it that influences behavior? How are behaviors learned, modified, acquired, extinguished? And these are not the same question, but they are two poles of the concerns of the emerging science of psychology. Before we embark on that to see how this science came together, it's worth noting that psychology as a field is much older than scientific psychology. Sci psychology arises out of concerns out of an attitude towards others, an attitude of care. It arises because we want to take care of each other. Psychology still plays this role. We have counselling, clinical psychology, and any number of self-help magazines. So it is originally soteriological. That means it's taking care of the person. That is a role normally, or hitherto, played by priests. This is, makes it clear why even with the advent of modern fMRI machines and electrodes and mad science stuff, we still see a lot of psychology aimed at providing advice to people. Notice chemists don't do that. Chemists do not provide advice on how to live your life. And when chemists are interviewed on the radio, they don't revert to a breathy tone like this, as psychologists are wont to do. Now all this, this rooting in concern but now becoming a science, that raises certain problems. We obviously need stories to tell about who we are. We need ways to understand ourselves. But unlike when we're doing chemistry, we are not disinterested observers. And so the very notion of objectivity itself, which you may have thought was a simple notion, now becomes something we need to consider carefully. Objectivity turns out to be a very complex notion. And as we're pursuing the development of scientific psychology, we will be aware that this is a response, a particular response to a broad range of questions, and it's always embedded in the science of its time.